Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and this is the How to Be Feminine and Be 10 Times More Attractive episode. Today, I'm revealing what your mom and your grandma would have told you about what it means to be feminine if they had known. My guest, Angela's husband, was angry, controlling, and distant, and she was depressed and numb, dreading the prospect of living the rest of her life in such an unfulfilling marriage. She decided to conduct an experiment, and today, her relaxed husband showers her with attention and gifts and help. She's going to explain what she did to make that happen. Then I'll be giving out the award for the worst relationship advice of the week. And this goes to a common suggestion you hear to make sure that you get treated well in a relationship and it just backfires like crazy. All that is coming up. But first, let's talk about how to be feminine and be 10 times more attractive. As a young adult, it made me angry when someone implied that men and women are different because that showed that they were prejudiced. I saw that as the old, unenlightened thinking. I smugly believed that I knew the truth. Everyone is the same, regardless of gender. I knew how to be assertive, speak up for my rights, and correct others for their backward thinking. I was charming like that. But I didn't know how to be feminine or even recognize my own astonishing power as a woman. And looking back, I feel sad for that clueless younger version of me. I was so hopelessly ignorant of the valuable contributions that I bring to my relationship and to the world as a woman that I tried to avoid seeming feminine. I equated femininity with weakness, and I was afraid that my gifts were repulsive. And now that I know what it looks like to be feminine, I find there's such ease and dignity and comfort in it. What a relief. I feel good in my skin when I'm my feminine self. And when I say feminine, I don't mean overtly sexual or manipulative. I'm talking about honoring my feminine spirit, which I will explain. Learning how to be feminine rocked my relationship and my world in the best way I can imagine. There are no clothes, makeup, or plastic surgery that can come close to having the irresistible magnetism of the feminine spirit in a woman. Tapping into your own feminine gifts, it makes you 10 times more attractive. Here is how. Receptivity is the essence of femininity. So I'm going to repeat that just to make sure you don't miss it, because this is the key to blowing wide open the whole mystery of how to be feminine. Receptivity is the essence of femininity. So to be more feminine, be more receptive. Consider receiving gifts, compliments, help, special treatment. Receive it graciously. And so that means if your husband says that you look cute when you have bed hair, you say, thank you, and nothing else. There's no need to explain that your hair is a mess. He has eyes too, and he doesn't seem to think that matters. So just receive. It means if a coworker says, do you want some help moving the chairs back? And you feel guilty because you know it's your responsibility. You smile and say only, thank you. Receiving graciously also means that if someone, your man, a friend, a coworker offers you a present, you receive that too. Hannah decided to activate her feminine gifts when her new boyfriend, Sam, offered to repair her dilapidated car at his shop. She agreed, even though she was afraid that she would owe him something in return. He also wanted her to drive his expensive luxury car while her car was being worked on. And to make it even more uncomfortable for Hannah, he put new tires on her car for free. And it was all Hannah could do to let him give her so much. She was nervous because she wasn't used to such generosity, but she was determined to experiment with being feminine by being receptive. Instead of demanding something in return, Sam was happy and proud that he had been able to help her so much. He seemed intent to find his next mission in service of bettering her life so he could make her beam with happiness again. So she got to feel special and have a roadworthy car, and he got to feel like her hero. Win, win. Now imagine if she had said, oh, you don't have to do that, and miss the chance to receive. 
she would have cheated herself out of that special treatment he wanted to give her. And he would have missed out on feeling proud and heroic. Lose, lose. So if you think of your body as a metaphor, when it comes to sex, you are built to receive. So is your spirit. Women are built to receive. Men are fundamentally attracted to the feminine. So the more receptive you are, the more feminine you will be. And the more feminine you are, the more attractive you will be. But it's not always easy. It wasn't for me at first. I found it nearly impossible to be receptive at times. So I rejected lots of gifts and compliments and help and special treatment. I always had my reasons. I thought I would owe a debt. But that's not possible. By definition, gifts are free. Same with compliments. Same with offers to help. Sometimes I was trying to prove that I could pull my own weight. Other times I had another agenda. I didn't want my husband to buy me flowers because it's a waste of money. I wanted to save money. Or I felt undeserving, if I'm honest and vulnerable. But each time I rejected what was offered to make my life easier and more pleasant, I missed a chance to feel special, to get that special treatment. I missed the chance to feel intimate with the person who was trying to lighten my load or delight me, especially my husband. And poor receiving made me less attractive. When my husband discovered he couldn't make my life sweeter and easier with his efforts because I rejected them for whatever reason, the intimacy suffered. Today, my priority is to have the intimacy, to choose to be feminine above my other silly reasons for not receiving. I have good receiving muscles now. I've been practicing. I've been working them out. You can start practicing too. If a man offers to put your bag in the overhead compartment on a plane, say thank you. If the bagger at the grocery store offers to help you out to the car, consider saying thank you. If your husband offers to change the comforter cover and you are afraid he's going to put it on sideways, just say thank you. If he says you're beautiful on a day when you don't feel beautiful, accept his point of view and honor your feminine spirit by saying only thank you. There's nothing more feminine than knowing you deserve to be admired, helped, adored. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest, Angela's husband, was angry, controlling, and distant, and she was depressed and numb, dreading the prospect of living the rest of her life in such an unfulfilling marriage. She decided to conduct an experiment, and today, her relaxed husband showers her with attention, gifts, and help. She's going to explain what she did to make that happen. Angela, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited for everyone to hear your story. So take us back to the battle days. What was it like in your relationship? Um, It was very hostile and um, I never felt like I could get my point of view across to my husband. And um, yeah, we had quite a, um, yeah, quite an argumentative relationship. And I just didn't realize, I didn't know why. And um so it was very frustrating for me and very depressing. And like you say, um, I was just, I wasn't the divorcing type. So I was sort of resigned to uh, living in a miserable marriage for the rest of my life. So, um, yeah, and that that was very sad uh, and depressing for me. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. what kinds of things had you done to try to fix this? So um, one of the first things that um, I found with the intimacy skills was um, the skill of respect. It really resonated with me. And, um, you know, I decided that I would try the skill of respect um, for a whole week and just experiment with it. And um, so what I did or did not do was criticize my husband, instruct him or comment on everything that he said all of the time. 
And I decided to consciously abstain from this for a, one whole week. And I have to say, Laura, that it was very, very difficult because it was a habit for me, a very automatic habit. So I had to be quite conscious of what I was saying and uh, not saying. And um, wow, Whew. by the end of the week, my husband looked so different. He just looked happy. He looked relaxed. We were laughing in the kitchen. We were having some fun together. And um, yeah, I was, I was really shocked Laura, because I was just like, wow, my critical words have just, you know, it was me that was um, kind of ruining our marriage. And um, wow, it's just great to see him happy. And I felt so much more happy. And, um, and I just realized that nobody had ever taught me how to be respectful um, in my relationship. And it was quite an epiphany for me and um, uh, the start of a new beginning in our relationship. Wow. I love this story. And I think there's like two pieces to what you're sharing with us. One is, like you say, no one ever taught you. So you just didn't know what respect looked like. You probably heard about respect, that it was important to be respectful uh, yeah, growing up. Yeah. Things like that, I- right? Yeah, and I always thought I was being respectful. I actually thought it was being helpful, um, giving my husband advice and being a little critical. I thought that was being helpful and respectful. So it was quite a shock to me to realize that that type of um, behavior was actually hurting our relationship and um, not being respectful. So it was like, uh, yes, pe- like people had said, you should be respectful in your marriage, but it was like a blind spot to me how to actually be respectful. So um, it was, yeah, like it was like an epiphany and um, it just, it was so revelationary, you know, uh, it just gave me a lot of power to know that I could turn my relationship around by starting to practice that skill of respect. So I love that. And you and you mentioned how hard it was for you. And I remember it was very hard for me as well in the beginning. So that's the second piece. Is one piece is knowing. And the second piece is being able to get yourself to do it. And so you were able to do it for an entire week. And you, you mentioned it was difficult. How did you get yourself to change so quickly? And, you know, how, how did that work? Well, my relationship was in such a bad state. And I was in such pain. Um, like I had to do something and um, so I just uh, just became very conscious of um, yeah I just I I kind of like I had to do it because I had to do something and um, so yeah just every morning I thought right um, I sort of gave myself a little check you know um, put some duct tape on if your husband annoys you in any kind of way, just don't say anything. Just put that duct tape on. And that's what I kept saying to myself all day and um, all through those days. And, um, yeah, like I say, it was really difficult to do and I had to be conscious. And there were so many times when I wanted to say something. And um, it was in those moments that I just was like, mm, you know, duct tape. And um, <laughs> it was quite amazing uh, what showed up when I wasn't uh, saying things all the time. <laughs> so was there a moment where you thought, well, this is, this is really working? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, um, you know, after me sort of noticing that, I'd, that my husband was looking a lot more relaxed and happy um, uh, with me doing this skill, and he didn't know that I was doing the skills. He didn't know I'd read this book. And at the end of the week, we went to my husband's, uh, sorry, my son's cricket uh, photos. Um, my family and I just went along. And and then my husband, I overheard um, one of the other fathers saying to my husband, um, Mike, what happened to you? It looks like you've been to Fiji for a week. And implying that he'd gone on, been on holiday for a week. And I thought, wow, this is really working. And um, I've got to do something about these skills. I've got to start practicing them um, continuously. So, yeah. And so how did you, how did you do that? What did you do to, to start practicing them 
continuously? Uh, well, one of the things I did do was, um, I guess, uh, get a coach and um, start to surround myself with some women who were committed to having a fantastic marriage, having a great marriage and um, working through these uh, Laura Doyle um, skills. And that really helped me, having that support from other women, um, reading through the material and um, just every morning um, having a little goal of what skill I would work on today. And um, and if I ever got stuck, um, getting some coaching about it. So. And um, that really helped me having the support of other women and having a coach. So yeah. I love that because it it sounds pretty hard. Even it's just you know a week when you were initially experimenting, but it sounds pretty hard to just not say all the things that you're thinking about every day. Like as a mere mortal woman, like I don't know how how long we could keep that that up. Did you ever feel like you were just sort of sucking it up or? kind of like sacrificing yourself I did I did but what actually happened was even though I sacrificed myself um what actually showed up was these other sort of magical things like a a really lovely conversation with my son my husband and his sons or um a really lovely compliment from my husband um that he might he said out of the blue um because I was you know using duct tape and so even though I sucked it up and I really wanted to say and um because I should be able to have the right to say whatever I want um actually abstaining from that that sort of critical sort of talking and um, that kind of thing, just just allowing some silence <laughs> on my part, actually sh- um, allowed these little miracles or big miracles for me to sort of show up all over the place. So it was actually really worth it. It was actually worth uh, me swallowing my pride, swallowing my, um, you know, wanting to be right about something uh, because these other little miracles, these other little beautiful conversations started to open up. So, yeah. So it was no longer worth the price of admission. It sounds like it was too, you could see the value of bringing the respect and it, it, that became more important to you, it sounds like. Yeah, exactly, Laura. Yeah, that just, there was a lot more intimacy um, and a lot more peace in our family um, because of that. Um, with my husband and with my family so I was just so grateful for I'm so grateful for that having learned that skill wow and so what's your relationship like now Angela Uh, our relationship now is just very more romantic and um, we do a lot more things together my husband shares with me a lot more about his um, his feelings and um, that never really happened in the past Um, I apologize a lot more if I slip up and I hear him apologizing too, which was something that never happened in the past. And we just generally generally have a lot more love and peace and intimacy in our marriage. And I feel so, so happy. And um, now that I'm the person that can create that beautiful relationship and I don't have to expect or blame my husband anymore I know that I'm the one that can um, create this beautiful relationship and that gives me a lot of happiness and a lot of power yeah I love that so um what what would you say to yourself if you could go back in time and and talk to Angela that didn't realize she just didn't know that she was causing strife in her marriage Mm. So if I could tell myself then what I know now is, you know, that trying to be helpful to my husband uh, by instructing him or criticizing him or commenting on most things that my husband did was actually being really nagging and disrespectful and it was really hurting our marriage. And um, I would just try the best that I could to not do that. And is your husband still uh, controlling and angry? I'm um, from time to time, but that just um, because I 
um, just duct tape, it's over very quickly. It's just, it's momentary. It's not something that lasts all day. Um, and, um, yeah, it's just because I know he's, he's a mere mortal human being just like myself. And, um, yeah, so those, those moments are very quick, very fleeting. They don't hang around all day or all week. It's just all, uh, momentary. So it's fantastic. And so this was so uh, life changing for you. You actually decided to take your studies further. And- yes, it was so life changing. I mean, uh, for me, my marriage was so important, and for so many years, I thought I was a failure with my marriage. It just, I felt isolated. Um, I felt lonely, and. Uh, it was it was such a revelation to um you know i just couldn't didn't think i could do anything about it and um uh to have the skills have just changed my life i can walk out my door and say i've got a happy marriage now i don't have a perfect marriage but i have a happy marriage and i'm content i'm happy uh with what happens in my house um uh with my husband and um you know a peaceful um relationship and um that that just is revelationary for me that i'm so glad that i found the skills um you know, your skills nora and um I, it's just changed my life so much for the better i don't feel depressed anymore i'm a really happy person um and if i'm not happy i know just how to get back um to being the happy person that I know I can be. And that's all through um, your skills, Laura. So it's just amazing, amazing. And so, and now you're a coach and you help other women. I do, I do. And I just, yeah, I love supporting women in their, um, you know, wanting to have the relationship that, of their dreams. And, um, and I really um, love doing that. So, yeah. So give us a tip. So if there's a woman, there's a woman listening who is also feeling depressed and maybe that there's nothing she can do to fix her marriage and that it's going to be a long life. What's your, what's your tip for her? Well, I'd say, um, have a look at, um, Laura's book and, um, give us a call uh, have a talk and see what we can um, we can um, do for you. And um, yeah, I, I just I really recommend having a look at these skills um, because, as I say, they transform my marriage. They transform me, and um, uh, that's what I really recommend. So if it's a yeah. fit for them, it almost sounds like a moral imperative for you to be able to share this because of the difference it's made for you and I just love that I mean these are these are difficult things to talk about and share about and yet you're very uh forthcoming and authentic with us and what why is that important to you Angela why would you do that um well if I could help you know help one woman or one marriage uh you know help one woman who may be hurting out there or stuck or just feeling like they're a failure in their marriage. If I could help one woman experience happiness, um, a sense of empowerment in that area, then um, I just would love to do that. I would love to have women, if they wish, transform their marriage like I've been able to do. So that's why I be a coach. So inspiring, Angela. Very moving. Thank you so much for your your honesty with us, your vulnerability, your courage, and sharing your story. It's just beautiful. You're welcome, Laura. Thank you. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. 
Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. It's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice that's got me fit to be tied this week is that in order to have a healthy romantic relationship, You have to set boundaries, just like a country with barbed wire fences and men standing as guards with guns. The problem is that boundaries only seem like a good idea when you're feeling hurt and angry with your man. And at that point, the boundaries come out like, fine, you can make your own dinner then. Or boundaries are about setting up the rules forever and forever. Like from now on, I will not be including your pants when I do the laundry because you left a pen in your pocket. In other words, they're not so much about saying, here's where I end and you begin. They're more like not so subtle ways to tell him he should go to hell. Those boundaries are not that great for intimacy, in my experience. That kind of boundary will leave you lonely. As a mere mortal woman, you're going to have limits to your energy. And it's always a good idea to acknowledge those limits in a dignified way. But that can feel vulnerable. Acknowledging you're at your limit on energy or patience, as in, I can't make dinner, can be very conducive to intimacy. Calmly saying, I can't do any more laundry tonight, or even, I can't do your laundry, could be a great way to preserve the intimacy in your relationship and honor yourself, if they are vulnerable, honest messages. Now, you might be thinking, but Laura, those are boundaries. That's what they are, acknowledging your limit. Maybe so. But that's not how I see them being used by the women who arrive at our campus struggling to figure out why her man doesn't seem to care about her boundaries. So maybe there's just a big misunderstanding about what boundaries are. I often hear about boundaries being expressed in anger with no vulnerability, And since vulnerability is what creates the fascination that leads to lifelong commitment and causes my husband to fly across the room to give me a a big hug, I can't imagine myself ever wanting to set a boundary as I see them being used. In my experience, vulnerability is going to serve the intimacy and inspire him to reassure me, help me, and love me far more than telling him where to stick it when I'm hurt or angry. I've tried both. And although it's much scarier, I prefer the vulnerable approach. And for that reason, the advice that you have to set your boundaries to have a good relationship is the worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Be sure to subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, I'll be revealing how to make your relationship emotionally safe. And it is so important to have fun. So today's fun fact is that when I'm a brat, my hilarious husband, John, says, I know a good book you should read. He means the one I wrote.